Welcome to Iris After Hours. Casual conversations with inspirational speakers off the clock. Hi, we are here in Pemba, Mozambique. Africa! (laughs) On location, bringing you Iris After Hours. This is the proof. We have real coke going on. With real sugar, no corn syrup here. We're here in his homeland. Come on, Mm. with the wonderful, amazing, my spiritual father. Who is this guy? Someone Mm -hmm. else's real father. Yeah, who could that be? Prophet, apostle. No, what is he? No, he's an amazing, he's a dad and he is, keeps us on track theologically, our spiritual dad and real dad, Papa I am, Roland. I am Heidi Baker's husband. Oh my gosh. Do you know did, Heidi did you Baker? Know that? Can you introduce her? <laughs> no, but we want to talk about some really important things today in today's podcast. Mm-hmm. Firstly, when is the Apple Watch going to be waterproof? So you and me can both wear one and go swimming together, Roland. Mm. Well, I've been trying to bring that promise to full term, you know, but yeah, I, I'm hanging in there. Okay. Here's the question. Will yeah. you buy an Apple watch when they are waterproof? <clears throat> I'll buy an Apple watch if I can tell time from it when I want to tell time from it <laughs> because you have to lift it and you have to wiggle it. And when you're speaking and you want to just glance at it, it's off weird. and you can't get it to come on right away. And yes. <sighs> frustrating. I know that. And then one. you go to the bush and you can't, you have to charge it every night, you know, and, and you, Really? Yeah, so it's not a bush watch. No. no. You know. it's, it's pretty tragic, you know, because... A bush pilot needs a needs an Omega. I've always believed that any Apple product has to be bought. You know, you, there's no choice. You just yes. have to get it, you know. But finally... There was one that you couldn't get because it just didn't shape up to the... We should email them and talk about missionary life. Yeah, they have no concept what we really what we need here. We need a waterproof watch that you can scuba dive with, you know. Yes. We're on the coast of East Africa, for heaven's sake, you know, <laughs> Indian Ocean, you know. You need a you need a watch you can wear. Exactly. <laughs> and I was thinking the other day, we too, we should, get, we should do something with Starbucks to get some... Because we have Starbucks coffee in the bush every week in Outreach. Mm-hmm. We should get a, a bush bush blend, asking for a... African bush bush blend of Starbucks or something. Yeah, bush, bush yeah, blend. yeah. We're trying to develop Africa, you know. There's, there's, there's ways to do it, you know. <laughs> and tell us, you flew us out and two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. You flew us out to mm-hmm. the bush bush mm-hmm. in the plane in the uh, what's it called again? The uh, well, the airline is Iris Air. Iris Air, okay. Iris mm-hmm. Air, yeah. come on. Yeah, you have a frequent flyer card, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. I got my I got my Iris frequent flyer card. <laughs> Now, on the landing, just one quick question. On the landing, Mm -hmm. we did a bit of a bounce on the first one. What Mm -hmm. happened? Because we came in, obviously, it's a dirt land strip, dirt Mm -hmm. landing strip. But when we came in, is this what happened? It felt like we hit the ground and we bounced up and then came Mm -hmm. back down? Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? Uh, (laughs) Why does that happen? Because I hadn't flown in a million years. Oh. <laughs> Wait, really? No, you have to flare at exactly the right time. When you come in very steep and fast, your timing has to be exact. But yeah. the next five landings were... Yeah, we're spot on. You got to iron that little (laughs) wrinkle out. Apparently, people were quite nervous because a couple of them had been in a situation with you. Mm -hmm. Was it last year Mm -hmm. when everyone thought they were crashing? You had to save the day, lift up the plane. Yeah, it was a strong crosswind, and the pilot uh, was doing everything the opposite of what what should have been done. So he was veering off the runway. And, you know, when that happens, you have to do something (laughs) like take off again. (laughs) <laughs> so, <clears throat> but no lives were in danger for very long. For very long. <laughs> for very long. Yeah. And it, it seemed to me you kept a very level head when you're flying. Is that important mm-hmm. to keep a level head? Well, yeah. If, if you panic and freeze, you know, it's that's not good. Yeah. Some pilots yeah. do that. You know, they, they just have a habit of going blank and freezing. Mm. But it's good. Not, not helpful. No, no. <laughs> I'm glad you're not one of those pilots, Papa Roland. <laughs> Yeah, so. <clears throat> Is there any spiritual analogies from flying mm-hmm. that you bring into the spiritual walk with God? Because I know Rick Joyner's is mm-hmm. a pilot. Yeah. And I don't know whether you've talked mm-hmm. talk shop with Rick Joyner about mm-hmm. flying. But I always remember him saying that there was a whiteout once and he had to fly by his instruments only because he couldn't mm-hmm. see anything. Mm-hmm. And it was a bit like sometimes in life when you can't see what's going on, but you just got to keep trusting God and walking by the word because he felt like he was flying towards the ground and he's going to smash into the ground. But his instrument said mm-hmm. he was going straight where he needed to go, but it didn't, it felt the opposite. Yeah. Mm. Well, your ears, your, your brain, uh, 
gives you feelings of motion when you can't see. Yeah. And so sometimes you really feel like you're veering to the left or you're veering to the right or up and down when you're, when you're not doing anything. So you have to, as a pilot, absolutely ignore your own feelings. Whoa. Just ignore what you think the plane is doing, you know, from the way it feels. And you, you, and you look at the instruments and you only believe the instruments. You don't believe what it feels like. Hmm. So yeah, there's a sermon in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful. In the Christian yes. life, you know, you're feeling all kinds of things, but you know, you, that's what faith, faith is all about. Knowing when you're on course. And... He used mm -hmm. to fly me to South Africa mm -hmm. for braces appointments, and um, mm -hmm. there's a couple times we went through a couple lightning storms. It's no big deal. That was so fun. We were flying right over hills, yeah. you know, and the lightning strikes. We hit trees just below us on the hills and fry them, you know, just a, just a big blast. The whole tree would just explode, you know, and be gone. You know, <laughs> left and right, that's exciting, you know, fly through all that stuff. Pilots love that stuff. Hmm. <laughs> Sarah and I would be like, so can lightning hit the plane or? Oh, not that often. <laughs> Turns out it really can. Most of my but... pilot friends have, you know, not been hit by lightning. <laughs> Most of them, yeah. But this kid, she liked rough rides, fast rides, you know. So she would always say, "Come on, Dad, let's do astronaut maneuvers. You know, let's punch holes in clouds. You know, let's come on, let's stay, come on, let's let's float pencils in the air. You know, coming up in a strong climb and then falling away so that everything floats in the air." Yeah, have you yeah. experienced that? No. You lose yeah. sense of gravity. Yeah, on the, on the plane, mm -hmm. and everything floats. Then we find little puffy cumulus clouds to mm -hmm. punch holes in. And it was, you know, she was fun. <laughs> it's not my mom's favorite. <laughs> it's actually not a lot of people's favorite. It makes them pretty nauseated. <laughs> not even Elisha liked that so much, but Christy was, you know, she's all for it. Come on. This is some <laughs> precious father-daughter moments yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Come mm -hmm. on. Yeah. So she's, she's made out of the right stuff, you know, oh. astronaut stuff. You know. Come mm. on. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do that, change course. You know, she could be crashing and she could just announce calmly over the radio, we're going in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you are, you are very level-headed, Christy. I mm -hmm. see that. Mm -hmm. And yet dramatic, it really depends. It's quite weird. Yes, like going to the latrine the other day, those screams were quite loud. Yeah. And we caught them on camera, so you'll see them in an update coming soon. We had another flight to Johannesburg at 3 in the morning with Sarah in the back seat. Mm -hmm. Oh, what was an emergency? Uh, no, we just had late meetings and we didn't even get off the ground till 1 in the morning. And we fly to this big international airport in South Africa at the wee hours of the morning, 3 to 5 o'clock. Gosh. But we f flew through thunderstorms. So the whole flight, you know, the sky's just lighting up with lightning strikes and and just flashing all over the place and our, our storm scope is just lighting up with strikes everywhere but you know not very big strikes you know, just no, not enough to take out the plane <laughs> hmm. so when did you first get that plane here in Africa could you, you landed here in 97 well we had a Cessna 206 to start with when you first came or yeah. how long did it take well we... we got that mm -hmm. in Got that here in 1999. No, so right, what did you get first, a plane or a, or a vehicle or a, a, a car? Oh, we had cars before that. Oh, you did, okay. <laughs> we did. Poorly run ones. Mm. Lazarus. Gods must be crazy. Have you seen no, that? No, Heidi, yes. Heidi comes to that Africa with... Oh, no way. She comes to Africa with no money, no place to live, no car, no promise of anything, no pledge support, no... She doesn't want me to clap. She wants me to stay calm and still. Yeah, one of these things. So I'm learning. Good job. <laughs> this no. is not preaching. This is. A, hey, we're in a studio. It's dramatic. Yeah, hey, he's a bit dramatic like you. Maybe you got um, some dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Don't don't do that. Okay. <laughs> seriously, don't. <laughs> she comes to Mozambique with no support. Yeah. So she ends comes to Maputo her first night. But just before she comes, she stops off in South Africa and goes to an auction and buys an old used Toyota pickup truck for some for seven thousand dollars. You know, ridiculous old thing. And she takes it to Maputo. And her very first night there, they, people try to hijack it three times. 
you oh know, my goodness. and it's you know it has alarms, it has gear locks, steering wheel locks, and you know every which kind of anti theft device, and you know. <laughs> Almost all our friends in South Africa in those days are, were, are driving new cars, you know, because not by choice. It's because they all had their cars hijacked, and <laughs> it was just a regular thing in those days. Gosh. We had missionaries that had their truck hijacked off the pier before they got it off, you know, when they got it off the boat. Before they got to the end of the pier, it was it gone. Was gone. <laughs> so finally, we got a brand new truck. Some Chinese church, little Chinese church in Orange County, California, bought us one. Wow. And the pastor said, you know, we don't want you to get your, your truck hijacked, so would you please get a bucket of rocks and just throw them at the car and dent it all up so nobody will want it. Seriously? That was our first new truck, yeah. We Did didn't do, do that? that, but then our first missionary who helped us... Uh, the first thing he did with our brand new truck on the very first day was load it up with rocks. And we didn't have any uh, no uh, rubber lining or anything like that, so he just took all the paint off the the, the load box the very first day. Oh my goodness! Then he loaded it up with kids and went out looking for landmines. <laughs> Machete Bill. <laughs> Machete Bill, yeah. Machete. <laughs> that was the truck or the guy? That was the guy. Ah. Bill Redding, yeah, he was <clears throat> hardcore our, missionary. Hardcore missionary. Yeah. I mean, please keep elaborating <laughs> on Machete Bill. He well, used to carve things, right, with knives in order to scare. Well, this bandits. is just at the end of the war, and there's hardly any <laughs> any organized police force. You know, they they need to be trained. They, they they don't know have a sense of proportion. You know, they if they see trouble up there, they just start shooting. And if they shoot the wrong guy, it's, you know, <laughs> scoop I'm just, just scoops. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends was a businessman, and <clears throat> a thief got into his office in an upper story, and he called the police supposedly the police and they said why are you calling me just throw the guy out the window <laughs> oh so my that's how they handle things in, in those days so it was wild mob justice yeah we had a guy in front of our house our apartment you know where we our flat he was just a petty thief stealing headlights but our neighbors got a hold of him and, and gouged his eyes out right in front of our house screaming bloody murder in the middle of the night oh my lord and our guard saw that, and he didn't want to be a guard anymore. But that that's, it was just, you know, very bloody time. Yeah. That's coming off of 25 so, years of war, hey? We were offered this, this orphanage way out, outside of town. And nobody in town could believe anybody would want to live out there where all the bandits are, you know. It's just really dangerous. But when we went out there, the people there couldn't believe anybody would live in the city where all the bandits are. <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> so, our first volunteer to live out there at that base was Bill Redding, Machete Bill. And so he he barricades himself into his room. You know, he builds a bunk bed way up there and and bars the door with big heavy beams and and you know covers the windows and nails everything down and thinks he's safe. <laughs> <laughs> One night, here come the, the bandits, you know, and they just bang everything down. They just break everything down. They broke the door down, the beams, everything. But he had a machete. And he made like David, you know, in the Bible. Like, he just made like he's insane. He just goes screaming wild crazy. He's just hacking up wood, everything, chips flying. <laughs> <laughs> just goes completely bananas, screaming, yelling, cursing, you name it. And those poor bandits, they fled for their lives. <laughs> <laughs> And from then on, he would sit in the sun and on the grass in the day and just slowly sharpen his machete, you know. And, and machete we called him Machete Bill, you know, and people left him alone. So. <laughs> right, that was our first missionary. Oh, was he Machete Big Kid? No, no, he was an American. Oh. He was a. Toothless or had something? Yeah, yeah, he had false teeth. He had like some kind of lisp or missing tooth or something. Yeah. Well, he was an army engineer. He helped build Cameron Bay in Vietnam during the war. He was very practical. Wow. You know, he's used to building huge, elaborate, sophisticated military bases in the jungle, and, and he could do anything. He really was practical. Wow. But in the military, that takes money. Yes. Yes. So he arrived Resources. at Chihango, where we were, and he looked around and said, Yep, yep, about three million bucks should fix it up nice. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted a year's supply of food in advance for his little room. 
Uh, and he made a list. Ham, jam, yam, and spam. <laughs> <laughs> You're serious. He wanted three million bucks and a year's food and all canned stuff, you know. And that was his condition. Spam so and ham. Ham, jam, yam, and spam. You know, that's what missionaries eat. <laughs> you said he loaded kids up in the truck and looked for landmines. You said that right? Yeah. Did he say that? Yes. What yeah, is I, I, the incentive I behind this? I'm still to this day. Oh, you need practical did, sense. Did, did, no. Detonate them? To, to I don't know what he's headboard. thinking. I don't know if he's trying to herd pigs and trying to set off landmines or... I don't know. Because there was a lot do. of landmines here, wasn't there? It was like... Yeah. Another thing you like, tried to do, you tried to pull out stumps out of the ground, you know, with a oh, brand with new pickup truck, you know, with chains. And he just <laughs> rode it into the ground, you know, the very first week. Did he find any landmines? There were a lot of landmines back then. Uh, he didn't, but we. one of our first volunteers from South Africa, a teenager, never been on the mission field. He's just a short-term visitor. He goes out walking around our property that was given to us, around the edge of it, and he sees a farmer, you know, in the bush there, and a and a pig running by. And a landmine gets set off, and blows the farmer's leg off, and he's all by himself. Oh no! He doesn't have any medical training. There's nobody around to help. He has to load this bloody, pulpy body into his truck and, and take it to the hospital, which has almost no emergency equipment. All by himself as a, as a teenager, first time in a foreign country. Wow. Gosh. Yeah, so... The situation, you know, we can tell funny stories, but actually, it really was one of the most terrible places in the world to live. The world's poorest country. Two or three million people were killed in the previous 30 years. Yeah. Almost every Christian and pastor we knew had either been in jail or had family members in jail. And the stories, you know, <laughs> those are real saints. Gosh. It took years to clear all the landmines after that. I heard last year that they were just finishing up somehow. Gosh. Clearing the but last But they ones. had more landmines in Mozambique yeah. than any country in the world. I think they tied Afghanistan, you know, for... Yeah, a number of landmines. Because from being from Australia, the most I'd heard about were, were in, I think Cambodia yeah. or Vietnam. A lot of yeah, land, but here there was way more, wasn't there? Yeah, and the primary method of clearing landmines is to poke a head with a stick, you know, on your hands and knees. Oh my <sighs> lord! Ah, and so, well, they're plastic. You, you can't detect them with Gosh. metal detectors oh, and X-rays and all oh, that they're stuff. Plastic. Yeah, and so, it's crazy. You have a strategic thing like a bridge or a dam or something, and, and the one side will put ring it with landmines, and then the other side will ring that ring with their landmines, and then the other side will ring that one with theirs again. And now you've got three sets of landmines, and nobody knows where they all are, and the old guys who know die off or leave. Yeah. And there's no maps. Oh, my goodness. And so nobody's thinking about the future, you know, what are civilians going to do? So actually, when we started, most villages were mostly women and children because the men, because the men were killed. killed. The average age in the army at the end of the war was 12. The older guys were all dead. That's crazy. And the, the army didn't want... Oh, I'm going to flock of birds just flying up to the window. That's so beautiful. <laughs> the army didn't want the outside world to know that they had a, a child army. So at one point they took 10,000 of their own boy soldiers, machine gunned them all into a pit all in one day. Oh my and We Lord. hired one of the guys who saw that happen. Wow. So it was... It, yeah, one of the passes. No, it, it, was, it, it was a very serious situation, so... Did you tell the story <laughs> of when you first drove into Mozambique? I don't think so. Or no, I would love to hear that. Yeah, I'd love to. Hear or that. I'm not sure. Was it the first time when the car ahead of you? Yeah, that's the first time I I came in. Yeah. I came in in January of 1995. Uh, okay. About six months before Heidi came. Oh, I so came, you came first. Yeah, I came first. And so, hey, this is a part of the story that nobody knows about. <laughs> Come on. He's the real pioneer. <laughs> Come on. No, we, like HA. we wanted to go to the world's poorest country, and so we did some research for a few years and read your Time magazine. Decided, yeah, read Time magazine, which talked about the war. I read the story to Heidi, and she says, 
let's go there. They need help. <laughs> and so we never looked anywhere else from then on. <laughs> <laughs> but it took a few years. We went to England and, you know, got prepared in a lot of ways. And But I was excited to finally get to Mozambique, you know, because we were aiming at that for quite a long time. Right. So in the States, while we were studying, finishing our degrees, we met a South African in church. He was a minister. And he had a brother who pastored a church in Malaland, which is near the border of Mozambique in South Africa. Oh, okay. So uh, this friend, or this brother, uh, heard about a, a conference in Mozambique. And he told his brother in the States, who told us and who knew of our interest in Mozambique, and he thought it would be good if I went and attended this conference. But it was nothing like the sort of conference you think of in the States. You know, these guys, these, these people, these pastors actually were, were from the bush, you know, and they're just in rags and no food, and it's a totally different sort of conference. But I was still, you know, excited to go because, you know, we had aimed at that for so long. So I flew to Johannesburg, uh, got into the uh, this this pastor's truck, and got all the way to Malalan, and and uh, we were putting together pieces and poles for a big tent that he needed to have meetings. This is my first experience in Africa, <clears throat> so I'm helping him gather all these big tent poles, these hollow pipes and poles to to use to put up the tent. I find out later that these pipes are full of these super poisonous snakes that, that crawl up and down the, the pipes. You know, we're handling all these pipes with snakes in them, and these are super poisonous snakes. You, if they bite you, you've got 20 minutes to live, you know. Oh, and, my Lord. You know, the black, I... black mamba snakes, you know. They're... I don't even know this story. <laughs> I don't understand. There are lots of stories you haven't heard. <laughs> So we're just happily loading the truck and, you know, the snake coming in and out of these pipes. And I did not know anything better, so I'm happy. So, like you see the snakes, you just don't know that they're... I No, I didn't see them. Oh. I would have been scared. Oh, okay. But ignorance is bliss. You know? Yes. So ignorance is bliss. I just found out later, so... Okay. <laughs> so we finally start driving another hour and a half or so to the border of huh. south of Mozambique. And we're sailing along in our little Datsun red truck. And about a mile from the border, the truck's engine starts missing. But it's almost five o'clock, and the border closes. You know they're very security conscious. It's, all, the, it's no, all barbed wires, machine guns. There's a border post. There's really it's lined with soldiers with AK-47s. So this it's is war seri territory. Serious border South Africa. Africans are afraid of Mozambique. You know, almost no South Africans went in at that time. Wow. And it, it got to look really scary. And they're closing the border at 5 because it's so insecure at night. And we have to get across that border by 5 because the first meeting is that night. And I've waited for years to do this. And it's so, the time has come, you know. Yes. <laughs> and we're not going to miss this, you know. We flew a long ways for this first meeting. We the... But the, our car died. It got almost up to the gate and it just petered out. It just, it just fizzled, you know, like water in the gas or run out of gas or something, you know, just push the pedal, nothing happens, and it, it just it just died, right there with the gate in sight. And then we, we see a helicopter, a big noisy helicopter fly overhead, and soldiers running all around us, and people yelling and screaming, and, and it turned out that there was a car right ahead of us that just made it through by 5 o'clock, and he was all shot up by bandits as soon as he crossed the, crossed the barbed wire. Oh the, the road is so bomb cratered, you know, it's just bomb craters and potholes and all of that. You have to crawl along in and out of these craters. And and so the car just pokes along and it allows the bandits time to jump out and get, your, get their guns on you and hijack your car and take everything. But that's happening now. That happened last week. And, and you know, the Wilcoxes just came up last week and passed yeah. cars that have been all burned and shot up. And, really? And... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, God stopped the car. You know, saved our lives in the very first day. So it was God. There wasn't. It wasn't any mechanical problems. No, no. We we hand pushed the car around, and as soon as it was pointed yeah. the other direction, it started up and ran fine. So we went back to Malalan, about an hour and a half away, and went the next morning in a big convoy, which is what we're supposed to do in the first uh, place. You know, safety yeah. in numbers. So. Wow, so you pretty, miraculously pretty, pretty exciting first day in Mozambique, you know. 
portent of many things to come. Uh, that is crazy. <laughs> Oh my gosh! So the next day when you got in for the convoy, it went. You yeah, got, you it was got to okay, Mapuche. but everything was shot up. What were you thinking uh, coming in? I'm thinking, wow, this is a this been a war here. Everything's burned. Everything's uh, the, the the buildings are shot out. The windows are all shot out. You know, the doors are ripped off for firewood. The roofs are gone. There's you know ruins everywhere. Mm. Um, <clears throat> almost nothing in the shops. The, the, Maputo was like a ghost town. Almost no cars. Almost no cars. Which is which, so which, which, crazy now. You wouldn't believe the cars now. You yeah. Know, the total traffic jam. Not you know, The city was never designed for this kind of traffic. Yeah. It takes hours to get through the city now. It's a metropolis but, now. Yeah. But in those days, it was it's just it was like a ghost town. You'd walk into shops, there's nothing on the shelves, and everybody's quiet. And a couple of gas stations and a whole city of two million people. Gosh. You know... <laughs> So that's where we dragged Christy. How old were you? How old were you then, Christine? 1987 eight, to 1995. Nine, seven, seven or eight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we thought that was a great place to take our kids. And... They don't know We had anything. no idea what, what we were going to do for school for this kid and her brother. So you we get... had no clue. And Heidi's not about to be a homeschooler, you know. She's not a homebody in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. <laughs> no, I couldn't imagine Heidi teaching People homeschool. asked us that. Oh, did your mom homeschool? <laughs> Elijah and I were like, <laughs> so, kidding me? So we didn't even <laughs> think about it. So God, it's your problem, you know. I don't know. We're, we're not about to leave her, send her off to boarding school or anything. So, But here we are. Yeah, because you, you were sent off to boarding school, weren't you? I was, so I decided, no, that's not what to do. So... <laughs> That wasn't fun. So what did you end up doing for school? For we the... didn't worry about it. We didn't even think about it. Come on. We're just sitting there. And I get a phone call. <laughs> Claude Myers. He was one of my teachers in my boarding school when I was in Taiwan as a teenager. No, shut yeah, he, up. Yeah, he, he taught me Same physics people. and science and different things and... I hadn't seen him and heard of him in years and years and years. And all of a sudden, he calls up and says, Hey, hi, Rollin. Remember me? I'm here to start a school in Maputo. In Maputo. Oh, my Is Lord. Is there a need for one? <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. He, oh, my Lord. This is crazy. Yeah, he was a missionary teacher, a PhD. And, but he can't get his container of school stuff into the country. Because I want books. Textbooks, materials, desks, chairs, anything. He's got this whole container of school stuff to try to do something for what the a, missionary kids. What a legend! In Maputo. This guy sounds so amazing. So he does. He doesn't have an organization. He's got no duty free status. He's not an NGO. He's not a five hundred one c three. He's just needs to get his stuff in. So guess who gets all his stuff in? Iris. Come on. <laughs> We have the people, we know the government, we have the permits, we have the NGO, we do all the paperwork, we get his stuff in. Rolling. Now you do have... all the paperwork, literally rolling. You probably did it all, did you? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I had a... You were the main... A, a Macintosh. A Mac. Which means you can type Portuguese accents easily, oh. unlike a PC, just to clue you in. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to do all these legal documents in Portuguese, but it was so easy because I had a laser printer and a Mac where they could do all the accent marks. And, Come on. And, You're always ahead so, of the curve, yes. technologically. Yes. So he just showed up with his wife. We got a few other teachers, and we got the missionary kids together. And and it was a small school, so but it was kind of like having Ph.D. professionals be your homeschoolers. You know, oh, that my small. Lord. That's it's amazing. very personal. What did you think of the school? Is that why you're so smart, Crystal? A little conservative, a little yes. right wing, little. <laughs> it was conservative, but it was amazing. They were very good at prepping for college. Mm-hmm. It's like a couple hours of homework a day. Uniforms, pretty strict, oh. actually. Yeah. But Uniforms. some of my best friends came out of it, so. Sarah. Wait. Now I think when missionary parents talk about bringing their kids to the field, I think. It was good. That's a big, like for a lot of kids, that's the hardest thing. If you it's, can't, don't have peers in school, yes. that can be really difficult. But for me, I had that, so it was amazing. It didn't hurt. Elisha left two years early, you know, because he was doing so well. 
he took his SATs two years early. Oh, really? Still got 97 or something on them, you know, on percentile. Gosh. So it was good education. Yeah. It was. Yeah. But we didn't, we didn't expect it. We didn't know what God would do. He just, you know, that just didn't worry about it. Didn't think about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, that is such a miracle. It was. And you and mom are academics, so that was probably high on the priority list. Yeah, and it's yeah, education is really important for your mom and dad. Yeah. Hey, mm-hmm. it's a, it's yeah, it, it, but I don't think mom would have enjoyed teaching you math and science. <laughs> I don't think I would have enjoyed mom teaching me math and science either. <laughs> so. But her brother ended up teaching some of his physics classes for Claude Myers. <laughs> oh, really? I taught at that school too. Yeah. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, it's cool. The other grades. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> when it, we when we became seniors, sometimes we would teach because they really had a need for more teachers. Oh, that's so cool! <laughs> yeah, let's pick on the students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a close family. You know, everybody's at each other's birthday parties and for Christmas and vacations and wow, so best friends. You know, went with us on vacations. And, mm. Wow, that, is he still down there now in M- Maputo? With the He's school? not, but some of the teachers are still there that she had. The school's still going. Claude may be in Beira mm-hmm. now. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, they're part of an organization that literally mm-hmm. finds mm-hmm. missionary loca- like missionaries around the world and start schools specifically for the yeah, missionary they, kids. Yeah, they had started schools wow. in, in China and different places. But it so was they've amazing. gone around. It's yeah. amazing that they picked Mozambique, you know, in our city, just when yeah. we arrived. Oh. I keep saying God's sovereign, and a lot of people, you know, doubt that. But, you know, we have evidence. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, you didn't pray the school in. He, no, he, he no, brought it to no, you. it was his fault. <laughs> Not our fault. He's we, to blame. We had no faith for that. We just, you know, God didn't think about it. That's amazing. Well, see, that's a theological issue. Have you ever heard people preach that God never does anything except an answer to prayer? Yes. And he never does anything except he tells his prophets first? Yes. Oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people just kind of assume. However, <laughs> God has more ways than that. Yes. Think of all the things that we don't pray about that God does, you know, every day. I know. I know. That would be... What if he only could do things we prayed for? <laughs> I think I would be in trouble. That'd be scary, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> Can people change his mind? Hmm. Yes and no. Yes and no? I, well, it's one of my favorite answers to theological questions. <laughs> yes and no. That's true. You do that a lot. <laughs> For example, I'm the boss of the family, right? As the father? As the father. Yep. But then Christy comes up and says, um, I need a fa- the biggest favor in the world done for me this morning. I need you to watch Zoe for two or three hours. Now, I can say I'm the boss, but who's really the boss? <laughs> so, yes and no. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, but she learned the secret of prayer. I, I've told this before. It's late at night. I'm in my office. I've got paperwork stacked this high. Urgent email to answer. Stuff to write. Books to read. Trying to think. Pray. I'm busy. I'm buried. Buried in my work. And here comes Christy. She needs something. (laughs) What does she do? She doesn't just beat the door down. She doesn't doesn't just crack the door and then say, oh, forget it. You don't care anyway. She doesn't collapse in a pile of tears and whimper behind the door. Why doesn't dad care? She just waltzes in like it's her office. Just waltzes in, <laughs> just walks right in brazenly, doesn't care what I'm doing or how busy I am, throws her arms around me and says, Dad, 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 you're the greatest dad in the world. <laughs> and oh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret of prayer? That's the secret of how you treat God. You know. Ah, come on. Mm. I'm learning something here. You learn, learn something there? <laughs> come on. I can't remember ever saying no. Because she learned the secret. Access to daddy's heart, huh? (laughs) So, even though God puts that goodness in your heart to treat him like that, 
He loves to be treated like that. So, in answering the question, can you change God's will? God is bigger than we think. Yes. Right? Generally speaking. Yep. <laughs> so, we tend to think that he cannot be in control and give us free will at the same time. But actually, he can. He can go out of himself by his spirit and create somebody who loves him back freely. And he doesn't just hope they'll love him. He creates the love in them back to himself. Wow. And that's just the most amazing thing. But when you love God like that, he loves to be told what to do. It's like a parent. They love for a kid to say, hey, dad, you got to do this. You know? Yeah, it's the, true. And in, in, a, in, a, in another sense, when somebody in power realizes he is really loved by somebody, yeah. he loves to be told by that person what to do. But that's predicated on that person having a good heart and full of the spirit and, and all of that, you know. Yes. And then when they are, they just, God just loves to do what we say. Yes, absolutely. But so the trick is to know what he wants to do in a given situation. But a lot of teaching on prayer and, you know, and doing miracles is, is not personal at all. You know, you're just taught to stand on certain verses and say certain things and declare certain things and believe certain things, but right. it's not personal. Yes. You don't even care what, about what God thinks about a certain situation. You just think you have the power to, to do something. Yeah. So, it's not very so nice you can manage, look at it? faith two different ways. One is that it's a gift God gives you and you can do whatever you want with it. And the other is that it's knowing God well enough to know what he wants to do in a given situation. Wow. That's kind of how First John sounds, you know. If my words abide in you and you do what I say, you can ask whatever you anything, want and I'll yeah. do it for you. Sort of but family. if you think you can just impersonally just uh, do stuff, you know, and teach people how to just do miracles without the relationship, without God's will having anything to do with it, that's... now there's an aspect to that. It's always a yes and no. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> like that. Oh gosh, it's always because like that, it's it? always like that because God actually can give you. A gift. Yeah. And it's irrevocable, so it can work. And so... Wherever your heart is. If you have... Mm -hmm. your if God gave him, you the gift, you can probably do some damage with it, I, I guess, you know? God's very... Um, but God takes a lot of risk it, with us, doesn't he? But it's still a gift. You can't yeah. just work it up and decide this is what you want to do because you got taught how. It's still a gift. Yeah, right. And so we should treat all things from God like a gift. That's good advice. Go, go lower still. Talk to him like it's a gift. But a lot of people teach that all these, all this power and all these blessings belong to us. They were paid for on the cross, and they're ours to take. And it's us, you know, it's our stuff. Let's get our stuff back. You know, from the devil. You know, he, he stole it. Let's get it back. It belongs to us. You know, he, it's all been paid for. <sighs> <laughs> it's called entitlement, but it's not even what the atonement was about. No. No, the atonement was about he who knew no sin becoming sin. Becoming our sin. And being punished for our sins. Well, that idea of penal substitution is not very commonly understood or preached. It's, in charismatic circles, it's, the atonement is often thought of as a some kind of event where, where God paid for, where Jesus paid for our blessings. So the least we can do is go get them all. Yes. But what it was really about is that uh, he takes our sin away so that we can partake of his nature and have his heart and live like he did. Yes. Turning the other cheek, going the second mile, putting up with whatever to show the love of God. Which is what the atonement really accomplishes. Whoa. Now, we also get down payments on heaven and the powers of the age to come, but those aren't what we love. Yeah. We don't love stuff. I mean, it's nice to have money, but I'm not in love with money. You know, it's nice to be healed, but I need a person to love. Yes. Mm. 
So I've actually learned a lot about prayer and God and from family life on the mission field. Yeah, right. Because it, I mean, that's very much the kingdom is is like a family, isn't it? And well, yeah. People with say, God why would a good He's heavenly father. father put you through something rough? Well, we put our kids through what something a little bit rough at Shiongo and for a while. They didn't even think about it. It was just normal, normal Christian life. That's true. Yeah. They had no choice. You don't know anything different. <laughs> <laughs> really. But I think a lot of missionary kids do feel uh, shafted, you know, cheated by their missionary upbringing. Right. About half of them, maybe. Did you feel a bit cheated by having no, to go to boarding school? All. No, a missionary you, kid gets you, to experience the world and cultures and, and travel and a broad come. variety of experiences and adventures and faith and miracles and and going places and seeing things yeah. and seeing what God can do that he, they never hardly ever see at home and seeing a side of the world most Americans should see but never do. Yeah. But you didn't yeah. love going to boarding school, being away from your parents, did you? No, but there's, it's yes and no. <laughs> you learn a lot because, in some ways, you're, you you became socialized. You got into sports. You, you got into you know social life, student politics, all sorts of things, clubs, events. Um, became much more sociable. Yeah, in that you had friends. You had lots of friends, lifelong friends. And it was a good school academically, a very very good school. Is that in Taiwan? Taiwan, yeah. English or Chinese? English. English. Yeah, it was an American school, right? American curriculum, but we had kids from missionary families from around the world. So we had Norwegian students and Canadian students and New Zealand students, you know, all from all over. Aussies. We had a few Pentecostal students, mostly evangelical students. Uh, yeah, but just missed out on being with our parents a lot. Mm. While they were on the mission field. Yeah. Yeah. We officially had uh, four-day weekends every six weeks. Ah. We had long weekends every six weeks. And every six weeks we had a report card, and we went home with our report card for four days. Ah. And so your parents. Yeah. And the, the big deal was if you got straight A's, you would get a, a banana split. <laughs> that was the big motivation to study. <laughs> Bananas. Brilliant. <laughs> and did you... But it wasn't enough. You know, it's never enough. Four days out of six weeks. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was... It wasn't too bad, though, because it was a two-and-a-half-hour train trip away, but a lot of boarding schools for people are completely in different countries, you know. Exactly, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. more than that. Like Rift Valley School, we, all, we, we investigated that for our kids in, in Kenya. But that, that was a long ways away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How old were you when you went to boarding school? Started in seventh grade. Okay. Went through senior, but it took a year and a half break in the States on a furlough. Oh, Did you? With you? Your parents. Mm. So we complain all the time about how long it takes to get between here and the States, for example. Uh. How it takes a couple of days. <laughs> jet lag. All the jet lags, all the layovers, mm -hmm. the crazy 16-hour mm -hmm. flight. Can you talk about what it took back then to get from the States to China via boat? Well, see. Did you do by boat? You oh. did it. The boat is Several a times. much more fun way to go. Is it where they get the, fra the phrase, slow boat to China? Yes. Oh, snap. Yes. <laughs> My grandfather, you know, <laughs> to be a real missionary, saying. you have to understand what being a real missionary is. Come on. You, know, I so you don't just jump on a plane explain. and go somewhere, you know, for a week. You quit your home country and culture and family and friends and everybody that you know. And you say goodbye to your one world, and you go to a completely different world, and you never go back. That for the for a hundred years, that's what missionaries did. Wow! The early missionaries to Africa packed their stuff in coffins because they knew they wouldn't live six months. No immunizations, no vaccines, no doctors. They knew they would get black fever, malaria, whatever, and be dead in six months. So they went anyway. Wow! Oh, and you said bye to your family. Yeah. Knowing that really So was my grandfather leaves to fulfill the Great Commission to China, deliberately to wanting to get as far away from the nearest white man as possible. So 
It's a slow boat to China on a, some old freighter. It takes a month or so to get across the ocean, at least. And then he gets pulled by coolies up the Yangtze River Gorge. You know, this is the famous gorge in China where, where coolies on narrow, narrow trails dynamited into the cliffs along the sides of the gorge oh. of the Yangtze River, slowly pull the, pull the, the boats up. up the river against the rapids. And it took months. And then you get up into the foothills of the of Tibet, you know, and you start to pack everything on the backs of yaks, and you spend more months getting up into the high mountains of Tibet. And finally, he gets three days yak journey from the nearest white man, and he's arrived on the mission field. And so my father takes school by correspondence all the way until he was 20 years old, all through high school, everything. It takes a year to take an examination, mail it to America, and get the result back. Oh my lord. He did that I all the way through school. No classmates, no American friends, just Chinese around him. Chinese is his first language. This is your father? My father. Gosh. And that's how he lived. But we took a slow boat once too. We took a freighter. In those days, uh, flying was rare, extremely expensive. And missionaries are usually get exhausted by itinerating and running around, you know, while they're in the States for a year. So part of the reason for taking a boat was to have time off. Yeah. It's a break. So mm -hmm. we get on a freighter, and these old freighters had room for about 12 passengers, you know. Twelve. Twelve. You know. Oh, my Lord. Old, old freighters. This was an English line, p and Orient lines, you know, and had an Indian crew from India. It takes a month to go to get across the Pacific. To... to Long Beach? From San Francisco to Manila. Oh, okay. A month. And it was an old ship, and the diesel engines would break down in the middle of the South Pacific. And they'd repair them while you're and sort the plane of would the, the ship would just drift around in the sunsets with the flying fish and the birds and the gorgeous <laughs> skies. And it was gorgeous. We'd dive off the ship and swim, you know, no for, for days. Could... And while they're trying to repair the engines, we're just drifting around, you know. And, oh, my Lord. And that was a great trip. That was a month. The Indian crew served a different kind of curry every night. 30 different okay. kinds of curry in one voyage. Oh. This is like Nathan's dream. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And on that voyage, I learned to play chess with the captain, and he was introduced to Coca-Cola. Very oh. momentous, a very momentous voyage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? Oh, about eight, nine. Oh, my gosh. Remember it like yesterday, though. And we get into Manila Harbor. That's so crazy. And that was so long ago. World War II was still strong in everybody's memories. So we the saw, big American base we was there. We saw there, and, and where MacArthur fought. You know. Oh yes. We saw the caves where the Japanese would lock up American prisoners at low tide and just let the tide rise and drown everybody slowly. And so, you know, we saw a lot of stuff. Then we took a much smaller boat to Hong Kong from Manila. Oh, okay. And then from Hong Kong to Taiwan in a, a smaller freighter. It just keeps getting. Only, yeah, it gets smaller and smaller. <laughs> and as it got smaller, the storms got bigger. Oh! oh so we had these great. big storms in this little boats. See, see, this? And in the see? dining hall of this freighter it faces the front, the bow of the ship with <laughs> windows. And we see this huge wave come, you know, and I'm just a nine year old kid. And this, here's this whole ship going down into the wave, and it crashes over, and we're underwater, you know, and we come up through the other side and climb up the next huge wave and go down into the next wave and go underwater again. And oh, man, it was really an exciting voyage, you know. And you're trying you try to sleep seasick? at night on your bunk, you know, and just rolling the side to hit the stop, and then you roll this way and hit the stop. And <laughs> He's just rolling back and forth all night. That's where your night came from, rolling. Go. But I'm thinking, how far can the ship roll uh, and not that, roll, that roll over, you know? So the whole ship just goes, just keeps going and going and going and slowly stops and then goes over all the way over here and you're just a kid wondering, how oh, is, is it, it going to just keep going? Or... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah, so missionary kids just... Had a much more adventurous time, you know, than most kids. Oh, you yes. You did. I don't know if you told this in the first mm -hmm. podcast or not mm -hmm. about being a kid in Hong Kong mm -hmm. and crossing the harbor with your little. Oh yeah, when Chinese he... girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> we got kicked out of China. Well, let's back way up. You know, my parents. Uh, my mother was pregnant when they first took a, a boat to China. Right. 
my dad was my mother's teacher in Bible school. Oh. Yes. Still, oh, my teaches mom was one of, her, one of her students, you know. Oh, very, <laughs> very special student. Yes. And so she's pregnant on the high seas and the typhoon hits. The typhoon is so violent that people are being thrown from wall to wall, breaking bones, you know, being hit so hard from back and forth. The captain was convinced the ship was would be lost. He, he, he believed the ship was going down. And the infirmary, the clinic, was just full of people with broken bones. They were just setting bones the whole time, and everybody was sick, and everybody felt they were lost. And I'm not even born yet, you know. <laughs> you were you were the pregnant. You were inside. Yeah, I was inside. It was rough. It was a rough trip. <laughs> oh, <my God>. oh. <laughs> it was really a rough trip. So sorry. And so we get to China and we get to Kunming, and then here comes Mao Zedong with his red army, and we can hear the guns in the distance, and they're going to take over the country, and you know, they they they're killing millions of people, millions and millions of people to do it. And the Cultural Revolution starts, and they're shooting Christians everywhere, you know. And they have quotas on how many Christians they, they need to kill every day. And we get ousted. And my mother says they could hear the guns in the distance while we escape by a riverboat down the river and then take an old Army C-46 plane to Hong Kong. Or, and we end up in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong's full of refugees. It's just jammed full of refugees from China. Right. That's what makes it so different from Singapore. It's just crammed full of poor refugees. Right. So it makes it so crowded. Ah. So we lived on a little island. So Hong Kong. No, no room in Kowloon. We we moved. We lived on a little island on the top of a hill, Changjiao Island in in Hong Kong Harbor, just outside the harbor. Wow. And it was so fun for a little kid. In those days, there was there was hardly anybody on it. It was just hills and caves and beaches, and we, we kids just had so much fun. It was oh just so my. much fun, and I had a girlfriend, five years old. <laughs> I had a cool girlfriend. She was so neat. And we'd explore That's caves cool and poke, poke, poke huge jellyfishes on the beach and do play all kinds of games. Well, Izzy's age, five. You know, you hide in caves and play games. And and one day I decided I needed to take her on a date. So I, I, I took her on a ferry to Hong Kong. This is like Izzy I'm, going I'm, across I'm, the harbor. I'm, I'm five, you know. And hey, you know, I've been there before. I know what to do. So... <laughs> <laughs> my, like... So Into I just take her. We we I, I'm pretty sneaky. We snuck on the boat without a ticket. You know, it's one of those star ferry kind of classic Hong Kong boats. Oh and I'm on the top God. deck. I still remember it exactly. And it was a really a cool trip because someone fell overboard on the way to Hong Kong, and the boat circled around getting this guy out of the water. And it was really a neat date. <laughs> and we we get to Hong Kong, and, and somehow I managed to get her strawberry ice cream, you know, downtown and all that. And my parents are completely freaking out. These kids have totally disappeared. You know, yeah. they're, they're calling the police and everywhere all over Hong Kong City, you know, and and they they send out search parties and they're just everybody's in a total panic. Well, I come back all by myself with with my girlfriend and go home and get in bed and what's the problem? <laughs> and my parents are all freaked out still. Everybody's panic stricken, crying, praying, and I come home and I'm just asleep in bed. You know, it's just everything's normal. <laughs> just a nail oh, on the tap. Went to bed. I'm just a classic. You just went to bed. <laughs> Oh, you're worn out. You'd be in a nap yeah. at five. Yeah, it's a missionary life. Okay. It's growing up. It's, a, it's, just, it's a blast. It really is. So you should try it. That's, <laughs> yes, I think I will. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think we had a time rolling, but that was awesome. Oh, my god. We gosh. need to do a serious series of this. Yes. Starting back here. Yeah. The Hong Kong series. We've got to... I have more stories, yeah. Yes, and yeah, so we're going to get to them. Imagine. Like yep. robbing graves or skeleton or skulls and okay. putting candles behind them, swinging them outside girls' dorm windows, you know, at night. And you could do a lot of things in boarding school. You don't do at home. So this is like a trailer. <laughs> we have to do a hot one. Trailer for next time. Yes. Okay. The boarding school series. Come on. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much again for joining us for another in-depth look at the mission life. With Papa Roland and his father and his grandfather and his daughter. It's been fantastic. So we will see you again very soon. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time. This podcast is presented by Iris Global. For more information or to support the work of Iris Global, please visit us online at irisglobal.org.